Well, good evening. This is Kerry, and we're going to talk about what's the right exercise for me. So welcome to this group call. Um, we do this once a month just to talk about different topics in Ayurveda that may be of interest. This one always is, is interesting because we always want to know, okay, so what should I be doing to get the best bang for my buck, if you like? So what I need you to do is um, go ahead and mute your microphone because then I... Otherwise, I can hear everything you're doing. And then at the end, we'll unmute microphones and then we can talk about questions. So let's talk about exercises in Ayurveda. And so would you be surprised then if I told you that a good exercise session is just 30 minutes long and considered complete just as long as you broke a sweat um, and normally, you know, if we break a sweat in our armpits, we break a sweat in our brows, then um, this is a good exercise intensity. So this is how Ayurveda views exercise as beneficial. So it's not about how tight you can make your body or how ripply your arms can look. Instead, Ayurveda says exercise should be used to increase agni. That's your digestive fire. Also, improve circulation, remove toxins through sweat, and keep our tissues toned. So exercise can also be calming for the mind, especially if we exercise out of doors. Our bodies love nature, and that's because we are nature, right? So whenever we can, and as much as we can, let's take it outside and let's move our bodies to break a light sweat every day for at least 30 minutes. So let's talk about exercises for Vata. So if you have Vata as part of your constitution, then you know that there is no other dosha that likes to move as much as a Vata. So you would think then that exercise is going to be really easy and quite natural for them. And yeah, that's true. Ironically, Vatas need to consciously slow their normally speedy pace when exercising. Like increases like and that energy is movement so what that means is too much movement will create too much vata they're naturally jumpy and wriggly they're constantly running their mind they're inconsistent in their thoughts so an exercise routine that brings more motion will create more kinetic energy in them all the time when what they really need is strength flexibility and stillness. So vatas benefit most from exercise that is scheduled, that is steady, grounded, and moves from intention. Now, anything that promotes keeping both feet on the ground is pretty good. It's, it's, it's a great exercise for vatas. That way, they're going to become more grounded. So vatas need a nice balance of strength and flexibility because they have much less muscle mass. And their really dry nature has a tendency to make the body stiff and to make the, them brittle as well. So what they need is moderate strength training that's going to build their muscles, provide stamina. Um, that is, can be a little clumsy. And although they can be the most graceful yoga teachers, the most graceful ballet dancers, they can trip over their own feet when they're walking. <laughs> so it's important for that is to use their own body weight. Um, to train. So yoga is really good for vatas, pilates, ballet inspired, any kind of exercise that's ballet inspired, the bar classes, these are all really good for vatas. And this makes the workout challenging enough without exhausting vata at the same time because they have a tendency to fatigue. It gives their muscle shape and tone, it increases circulation, and also provides really well needed flexibility as well. So why vatas shouldn't run? And that's because anything too cardio intensive will increase the already swift motion in vatas mind and body. That's going to create more movement. It's going to create craving for more movement. And then vatas are going to just fly away like a balloon without a string. They're just going to be out there in the ether somewhere. So unfortunately, many vatas love to run. And that's pretty understandable because it's so natural for them. 
they can just stride effortlessly like a gazelle. And in fact, gazelles are better. But it's not the best exercise them. So hear me out why it's not the best exercise for them. And that's because it's all about balance, right? So if you're a vata and running makes you feel really, really amazing, then there are some tips that you can do. So first off, limit the distance that you run, otherwise you're gonna strain those delicate joints that you have. Balance running with a great amount of stretching. Add yoga a couple of times a week, a really good stretching exercise. Important to look at your shoes and get new shoes every six to nine months. So that makes those joints um, very stable. It's gonna support those joints for you. And do Abhyanga regularly. Remember, Abhyanga is that oiling that you do every day. So if you do run as a vata, and if you notice any vata type of symptoms from running, like anxiety, um, emotional roller coaster thinking, bloating, gas, a scattered mind, sore joints, then you really need to reconsider running as your primary exercise. When we look at pitters, well, you know, pitters, they like the physicality of exercise. So a pitter doesn't need a whole lot of motivating or coaxing to get moving. Um, they can just get up and go themselves. They normally seek out physical activity. They love competition. But pitters need to avoid exercise that is either too competitive or too heating. So pitters are going to do best with a combo or a combination of cardio that combines a cooling element like cycling, swimming, kayaking, as you can see here. Cool air and cold water is what's going to make Pitta feel like that they've had a really great workout, but it's not going to overheat them too. Um, a consistent yoga practice is also very helpful to de-stress de our Pittas who can get pretty intense. They love to sweat. They normally sweat quite easily. And if they don't sweat in a workout, then they're going to feel that it just wasn't worthwhile. They didn't get a good workout. It also explains why pitters will guzzle lots and lots of water. Pitters invariably have a water bottle with them every minute of the day. Not only do they need to cool their heat with water, but they're constantly losing water through sweat as well. Now, pitters can do some strength training, although they can actually end up feeling a little heavy because their muscles are so easily sculpted, they can build muscle mass pretty easily. But, you know, for some pitters, they really do love the challenge of seeing how muscular that they can get. When we look at the type of exercise that's really great for pitters, first off, they should not exercise in the sun nor should pitters do hot yoga. I am amazed at how many pitters are doing Bikram yoga or hot yoga because they love that intensity. They love the feeling of their muscles being really loose, but it's, it's actually the worst exercise for them. It's just too hot for them. And what this is gonna do then, it's gonna cause irritability. It's gonna cause overactive acne. Remember your acne is your digestive fire. So if that's too strong, then you're gonna burn through your food. You're gonna be constantly hungry or constantly have diarrhea, and you're not gonna be able to absorb the nutrition from your food. You often find a pitta that's out of balance, that's exercising too much or in the heat, they have this real sort of supercharged competitive streak. Um, or they just have an inability to find stillness and peace in their mind. And this is a pitta that's, that's just too intense. So what can pitters do? Well, working out under an early morning or cloudy sky with a little wind near water is, is actually a great thing for pitters to do. Pitters, you know, you can also enjoy a brisk evening walk when the sun is setting. In fact, you, in fact what's perfect for you is a walk along a lake or a river at night as the sun is setting. Or even better, go for an evening run in the dark when the moonlight is shining. And that silver light from the moon is actually a cooling light as opposed to the light that we get from the sun, which is a heating light. Let's look at our lovable kaffirs. 
And it's really important that kaffirs vigorously move and sweat. Now, kaffirs are the hardest dosha to get into a consistent exercise re regimen, and that's because they lack that mobile quality, that ability to move that vatas so easily have and pittas have too. So they have a tendency to stay steady and stay slow. And that's, it's because it's just not in their nature to move. But once they, once a kaffir finds an exercise routine that they love, they're gonna feel really light, they're gonna feel alive, and they're gonna feel energized. So you've probably guessed it from this picture that cardio is the best exercise for kaffirs because it's gonna balance their heavy static quality. Now, cardio, what is that? So that can range from a little bit of running, a little bit of walking, to power walking, elliptical training, anything aerobic, anything that gets that heart rate up. The key for kaffirs is to have a buddy, an exercise friend. So remember kaffirs, they're all about love, they're all about companionship. So a kaffir will even feed off the energy of a lively batter or a sharp pitter. That's gonna keep them going as well. Kaffirs will need their workouts to be invigorating. It's gotta be enjoyable. And it's got to be fun so that they have something that they can look forward to. Kaffirs are pleasure seekers. They're pleasure exuders. So if it's not fun or it's too physically difficult, they're just not going to do it. Their stubborn streak's going to come into play and they're, they're just going to refuse to do it altogether. They won't stick to a regimen. Um, if they get too sore or too uncomfortable, they're just not going to do it. Now, did I mention kaffirs are stubborn? <laughs> they are really hard to move and they are incredibly stubborn. But what kaffirs actually need is a lot of positive reinforcement from their friends around them. And they need to do an activity that's fun. Now, daily exercise is really important to keep the digestive fire strong, to induce a sweat, which is gonna help release toxins, it's gonna to help release excess water, and it's gonna break up that kaffir stagnation. So kaffirs, even if you do just 20 minutes a day of power walking in your neighborhood, that's gonna be great, just do that. Buy a new pair of squishy sneakers, move your body, you're gonna feel fantastic in no time. So let's look at kaffirs, and one thing that kaffirs should not do is lift heavy weights when we look at what's good for kaffirs. They're already quite strong. They don't need to make their muscle tissues even more dense. They have pretty dense tissues. So what kaffirs need to do is it's really important for them to lengthen and to lighten their body. Now kaffirs are also not great love, great not great runners. I nearly said not great lovers. Wrong. wrong. <laughs> Wrong, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just, just the wrong PowerPoint here. <laughs> so they're not great runners, and that really is because they're not light on their feet. If you've seen a kaffir, they're pretty pounding on their feet. So kaffirs, if you don't want to run, hey, that's okay. Just find an activity that you really enjoy. That's key, first and foremost. Maybe going for a hike, but wearing a pretty heavy backpack, or um, hiking to a beautiful field full of flowers. Something like that is, is what a kaffir would be quite happy to do. Let's talk a little bit about eating and exercising. I was watching my, my niece the other day and she had a big meal and she said, oh, I need to go work out. Now, exercise after eating is one of the worst things that we can do for our digestion. And that's because the food gets pushed deeper and deeper into our tissues instead of moving through the digestive tract. That's really not any good because that creates armor. Armor is digestive toxins. Armor, if it's not removed, creates inflammation. Inflammation creates disease, creates some of the symptoms that you're trying so hard to relieve. So the food then can no longer be used as fuel. So what the body does is it just packs it away, it files it away. So we actually ends up putting on weight if we exercise after eating. 
So another big problem that I come across is actually over-exercising. This is a tendency that vatas um, have a tendency to go towards. It is true as well. And really, I think a lot of this has to do with our culture. So in our Western culture, we can have pretty extreme views on exercise. We tend to feel if we're not busting our butts three times a week for at least 45 minutes, then we figure we may not as well bother. Am I right? For many of us, a daily brisk walk for 20 minutes or so just doesn't seem like enough to make a physical change, right? But believe it, it could, it could be just right for you. Remember that appropriate exercise in Ayurveda is daily. So, so the consistent exercise is what's really important and should last for 20 to 30 minutes at an intensity that breaks the sweat, just a light sweat. If you don't sweat at all, then you're not exercising enough. If you're dripping from head to toe, it's way too much. So a little sweat is just right. Over-exercising, what we're going to see when we over-exercise is first off, we're going to see increased hunger. We're going to see injury, injury to our muscles, injury to our joints, fatigue, a breakdown of tissues. We go into that catabolic state where we start breaking down our tissues and overall stress on the body. So it can just be way too much for the body. Consistent exercise that we can do or maybe five to seven times a week is best for our bodies and our digestion and our acne, our digestive fire. Our body will then rely on the schedule, which will give our tissues daily use. And as health maintenance, regular exercise will also clear out our minds and help prevent stress buildup too. And many of us are looking to be able to handle stress in a better way. Exercise is one of those ways. So again, consistent exercise that you can do five to seven times a week for 20 to 30 minutes a day to break a sweat is going to be best for your body and best for your digestive fire, your acne. And if you're unfamiliar with acne, we talk a lot about acne. So acne is your metabolism, your digestive fire, we often refer to it. And it's important to have a really efficient metabolism. We store our toxins in our fat, and if we do not have an efficient metabolism, those toxins are just gonna store up, and that's when we get symptoms, and that's what creates inflammation. So exercise is one of the best ways to increase acne, because it creates heat from within, and we know that. When we exercise, we get heated up. So we also have to be mindful not to send our acne or our metabolism into overdrive because then we're going to get super hungry and that's going to cause us to overeat. And some of you may have experienced this. If, you, if you've run a marathon or a triathlon, when we exercise with real high intensity, like doing things like boot camp, cross training, or some of the extreme sports, our bodies are going to crave more fuel. We're going to get those cravings to be able to eat more. And that's because it craves more fuel to maintain the hard work we're doing. Now, if we're a professional athlete, or if being physically fit is part of our day job, we truly do need to expend more energy and we're gonna need more food. However, most of us, you know, if we work out, we might work out at a very high intensity of only two to three days a week. That is not gonna be enough to burn off all the food that our acne, our digestion is calling for. So just watch that you don't increase your food too much because you're working out. So overall, keep your acne or your digestive fire strong through exercise, but don't overdo it. That's very contrary to how we think in the Western world. If you find yourself constantly hungry, just check out your workout routine and see if you need to bring down the intensity a little bit. And with practice, you'll find your perfect spot where your digestive fire, your agony, if you like, your exercise and your nutrition are all gonna work together for you. And lastly, toss out your scale. I am 
so surprised. I'm not surprised actually, but it's disheartening when so many people rely so much upon a set of scales. Your physical body, your emotions, and the way your clothes fit are going to be a much better gauge to determine if you're if you're at a healthy weight for you than what the scales say. So I had people telling me, oh gosh, the scales were up two pounds. They fluctuate five to 10 pounds in any given day. It's only a measure of gravity on the earth. It doesn't really mean very much. So I threw mine out years ago. Go ahead, throw them out. You will know if you're at a right weight for you. You'll know how you feel. So that's a little bit about the right exercise and how that works with our digestion. And then let's turn it over to um, questions. And if anybody has questions, then that'll be great. Right now you're all muted. So if you have any questions, you're gonna have to unmute. I'll go back to sharing the screen for questions. Hi, Carrie. I guess I'll just jump right in. This is Jessica, if that's okay. Can any you hear questions? Me? Can you hear me? You need to unmute your microphones to ask a question about what might be the right exercise for your dosha. And one of the questions I'm often asked is, um, what happens if I'm a dual dosha? So remember, if you're vata pitta, then in the winter, you're gonna follow your vata exercise regimen, and in the summer, you're gonna follow pitta. If you're kapha pitta, summertime, it's all pitta. And in spring, winter and spring, is when you're gonna follow kapha. And what else have we got? Vata pitta, kapha pitta, that's pretty much it. Um, any other questions? Can you hear, hi, Carrie, this is Jessica. Can you hear me? Then it looks like we are fine for tonight. So thanks for joining me here this evening. We do tend to do this um, once a week. Uh, sorry, not once a week, once a month. You can tell it's getting late for me. Once a month on the 28th of each month where we do talk about... Um, a topic that's really useful so I will get to you about next month I also record this as well so feel free to um, I see some people I'm trying to ask a question but it's not working um, so you do have to unmute your microphone some of you have got your microphones muted um, so go ahead and type it and then I can reply back because I'm sure it's a question that many have so go ahead and do that. And while you're typing that, if anybody else has any questions. But remember with exercise in Ayurveda, it's about being gentle to the body. It's not about pounding the body and pounding the joints. It's about being very, very gentle, which is why we say 20 to 30 minutes a day to bring up a light sweat is all we need to do. So the question is, I am a kapha pitta, but currently with a vata excess or a vata imbalance, what would be a good exercise plan for me? So when we are one particular dosha or a combination of doshas, but we have an imbalance, we always treat the imbalance first. So for you, Jessica, it's going to be anything that grounds vata. So you're not going to be pounding the pavements running. You want to do things that are going to keep both feet on the ground to keep you grounded and stable. So walking is really good for you. Yoga is really good for you. But you would not do aerial yoga, anything that has you flying through the air, or you wouldn't do dancer pose, for example, that has you very extended. It would be the triangle series, um, where you've got both feet on the ground most of the time to keep you very grounded, very low to the ground. So, um, as, as, as I said, many vatas actually do love to run, and I've had 
many of that to turn around to me and say, you can't take away my running, but they actually feel a lot better when they, when they reduce that running. So to come back to your question, Jessica, yep, great question. Always treat the imbalance first, the dosha that's imbalanced. Any other questions? It seems like um, the, video, the uh, sound is not working, but you can use the chat and ask questions there too. Then I think that's everything. Remember, I'm here for you and uh, I'll send you out an email talking about next month's talk. If there's anything specific that you really want me to cover and it's of interest to you, then I'm happy to discuss a topic that's of interest. These are just topics that I've picked up because people have asked me over the years and these are the general ones that come up. Um, but if you have something that you would love me to go into in more detail, then this is your opportunity to do that. So they're always pretty short, probably no more than half an hour. Um, I don't want to keep you here on a Friday evening, but thanks uh, for joining me this evening, and I'll be talking to many of you within the next couple of weeks. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, so take care. Bye-bye.